All right, so all of this is functional MRI. All of this is really ancient functional MRI. Um, why, why would we want to use any other methods besides functional MRI to try to understand what the PPA is doing? We could just do only functional MRI and not use any other methods and make all our claims. What would be the problem with that? Well, we're going to have a hard time getting better spatial resolution than functional MRI, in human brains at least. Right? Every once in a while, even when you have an electrode in there, usually the electrode is pretty big and your sampling is pretty broad. So in humans, functional MRI is pretty much the best spatial resolution you can get. What are, what are uh, other limitations of functional MRI that might lead us to want to look at other methods? Right, I keep asking this. I'm going to keep asking it until you guys are all, uh, every hand in the room goes up. Right? Functional MRI just tells you that thing turns on when you look at scenes and various other details of that ilk. Doesn't tell us at all that you need it to recognize scenes or to do anything with scenes. Absolutely. So to find out whether it's causally involved in scene perception and not just turning on, perhaps coincidentally, or not coincidentally, but not causally, on the chain of scene recognition or scene perception, we need a causal method, and a causal method is a disruption method. Okay, now unfortunately, the PPA is way deep in the brain. You can't reach it with TMS, big bummer, too bad. Um, you can reach a more peripheral region, which I'll mention shortly, that's out on the lateral surface that's scene selective, uh, that goes by various names, TOS, OPA, stuff like that. One of the reading, readings in, involves zapping that region to test its causal role, but we can't do that with a PPA. Um, so what are the methods that are left open to us? Two main methods in humans to look at the causal role besides TMS. What kind of probes? Yeah, uh -huh. And what would you do with them? Yeah, stimulate those regions, absolutely. What else can you do? Absolutely, like I started this whole course with, Bob. Remember the case of Bob? Okay, well so there's a bunch of people with various kinds of brain lesions that uh, produce navigational deficits. They're broadly called topographic disorientation. I had a whole chunk of this lecture on topographic disorientation, and it, the, there are many different versions of it, but I had a hell of a time mapping it onto those particular functions I started with, so I, I punted and I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna make a whack at that for Wednesday. It's a bit muddy, but there are very interesting um, dissociations with patients with different kinds of deficits. Bob can recognize places just fine. Like when he sees a familiar place, either because he's there or because you show him a photograph, he knows exactly where that is. But then if you ask him, okay, which way would you turn from here to get to some other place you know, he doesn't have a clue, okay? So that's one kind of deficit. That has to do with getting your bearings, like knowing what your orientation is and relating it to your cognitive map. Okay, we'll talk more about that. So absolutely, if you wanna test the causal role, we can use TMS, not for the PPA, um, we can use um, brain stimulation and we can use patient studies. Okay, so I'm going to mention briefly a brain stimulation study. Um, okay, so this is a, a paper by a guy named Megavond. Um, and as usual with these cases, this is you know, a rare tiny speck of data that's tantalizing, but not as much data as you'd like. Um, and this is from the case of a patient who is being uh, operated, is about to be operated on neurosurgically and therefore has electrodes in his head for the purposes of the neurosurgery and who has um, generously agreed to uh, respond to what happens when those electrodes are stimulated. Okay, so the first thing, the first problem you need to solve is where are those electrodes and how do we know that they are on top of the parahippocampal place area? Okay, so these guys, um, got their patient to do a functional MRI experiment. This shows the response um, of that patient. Oops, my pop-ups got messed up. PowerPoint crashed on me like three times this morning and messed up my slides. This one's still messed up. Sorry about that. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, this, these are brain regions that responded more to um, houses than other visual stimuli. You guys already know better than Megavond. You, if you were doing this experiment, what would you have done instead of houses? Well, yeah, uh, he, he compared these to, to objects, right? House, well, other visuals to me. Yeah, we just saw scenes drive this region much better than houses. So it works, he probably got the right place, he just didn't know enough to do the most powerful experiment. Anyway, no problem. He finds, this is the functional MRI data in the same subject, he finds the, the PPA like that, and then this is where the electrodes are in the subject's brain. Okay. Um, so then, he does intracranial recording from those electrodes when the subject is looking at houses, faces, bodies, tools, and patterns. 
Okay? And what you see here is the time course um, from D DTI 32. Where is that? DTI. Right here, recording right across those two electrodes. This is the magnitude of the electrical response from the surface of the brain in those electrodes over time, this is probably two seconds there, when the guy is looking at houses and other things. Okay, everybody see that selective response and even more so at this location? Okay, so again, we're just recording. The MRI is now being supplemented with intracranial electrical recording. That's great. That's complementary. It's a different method. It's closer to the to the um, actual neural activity than functional MRI, which is very indirect, going by way of blood flow. But it's still not the causal test that Joshua suggested. Is that right? Sorry. <laughs> right. Um, so now we got our we got our bearings in the brain. Um, now what happens when those electrodes are stimulated? Okay. So um, I'm sorry, this is really hard to see, but it's on the printout, and I'll read aloud the, um, the important parts. OK, so they stimulate at these two electrodes here, three and two, OK, in the, in the white oval. Um, and the neurologist says, did you see anything here? Patient says, I don't know. I started feeling something. I don't know. It's probably just me. Neurologist says, anything there? They stimulate again. No. Anything here? No. So nothing happens when you stimulate right there, OK? So next. Um, they stimulate on these two electrodes, one and two. And neurologist says, anything here? Do you feel anything? See anything? Patient says, yeah, I feel like, looks perplexed, puts hand to forehead. I feel like I saw, like, some other site. We were at the train station. Neurologist says, so it feels like you were in a subway? Yeah, outside the train station. He's sitting there in a room with electrodes in his head. You stimulate him and he feels like he's in the train station. Neurologist says, um, uh, let me know if the sensation, like uh, if you get that sensation again, do you feel anything here? No, and then the neurologist says, did you see the train station or did you feel like you were in the train station? Patient says, I saw it. Okay, that's one second of data, but my God, is that informative. I saw it, okay? All right, so now, um, what else? We've got a few more of these. Okay, so there's more garbage here. Let me just read the good parts. Um, okay, so he's stimulating right in that same zone, two other right next door electrodes. Um, and he says, um, um, I don't know really what to make of it, but I saw like another staircase. The rest I couldn't make out, but I saw a closet space. But not this. He points to the closet facing him in the hospital room. That one was stuffed, and it was blue. Then the neurologist says, have you seen it before at some point in your life? And he says, yeah, I mean, when I saw the train station. Um, and uh, then they do it again. They repeat the stimulation down here. Neurologist said, did you see it again? Yeah, I saw it again. Same thing, the staircase? Yeah. OK, so again, it's a tiny little snippet. But train station, closet, staircase. Doesn't that sound like spatial layout? It does to me, right? So here we have just a shred of data, but a very compelling shred that's consistent with the idea that that region doesn't just respond uh, when you look at the scenes that depict spatial layout. It's causally involved in that if you activate those neurons, you can produce a percept of spatial layout. Just like we saw before, with the videos of stimulating the face area and the person sees a, a, an illusory face and stimulating the color area that we did at the end of the lecture last time and the person sees rainbows. Crazy, right? Those are in some ways the strongest kind of evidence in human cognitive neuroscience. Unfortunately, they're incredibly rare and we rarely get them. Okay, any questions about that? It's, you, know, it's, it's, you can't lean too hard on it because it's just this one guy, a few little trials and that's all we got. Um, but it's so tantalizing, it's hard not to be compelled by it.